You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 24, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Introduction to Immunology Part 2. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. about activation more so than anything else so far. So now we're going to talk about the other side of the story. So if once the inflammation has taken care of the contagion, our local immune system takes care of some of its layers. So attenuating the immune system. How does it attenuate? It? So for example, say in uh, places like intestine, where there are lots of um, uh, commensal bacteria and uh, maybe some of the bacteria that some of the things that we eat may even have pathogens. Um, but some of those layers uh, are not going to harm the intestine all the time. So how do you kind of make sure that there's not much inflammation, inflammatory response that's induced? So for that, there are some cells called inducible uh, T regulatory cells or IT regs. Um, and these IT regs are T helper type of cells, which are produced from TH0 cells. And remember, the dendritic cell and the T helper cells interact in specific cytokine environments to produce different types of subsets of T helper cells. So when there is an environment of TGF beta, the helper T cells produce what's called IT regs. That, to, uh, that then release specific cytokines, which are called TGS beta and IL-10. And these cytokines help to attenuate the immune response. So how do these cytokines do that? The TGS beta also gives a positive feedback to produce more, more IT regs, and they reduce the proliferation of uh, T cells and make the CTLs less vicious. On the other hand, the IL-10, block the co-stimulatory signals, um, like CD28 and CD7, so basically those signals are blocked, which help to do, um, and make it more difficult to activate the naive T cells. So together, their response is that they, the uh, immune response gets a little weaker. Well, so once, so that's basically in places where you really don't need the immune response to begin. What happens where there is an immune response and now we need to deactivate the immune system? So one way that the immune response is reduced is the reduction of the antigen itself. The antigen drives the immune response. And once the immune system controls the infection, that antigen itself reduces in amount. So the, um, because of that, the APCs that are activated by those antigens, are that activation is reduced. And because that innate immune system activation is reduced, which drives the activation of the adaptive immune system, the adaptive immune system comes down as well. So that's deactivating the immune system. So how does that happen? Basically, if you think about it, when, when we talked about activation, there was interaction between an APC and the naive T cells. When they interacted, the APCs had these host stimulators, so B7 on it, which interacted with C28 to make sure that it gets activated. So as the immune response uh, progresses and the invasion, the, these T cells, once they are activated, they, they do the fight, uh, fighting or producing the cytokines, depending on what their function is. These activated T cells stop, produce, stop expressing as much CD28 and express some other molecules on their surface. And they are called something called CTLA4 and PD1. 
and what the, what happens with the CDLA4. So uh, this is like the later part of the infection when the more CD, CDLA4 is on the surface of the uh, activated T cells than CD28. The B7 binds to CDLA4 rather than CD28. So the affinity for CDLA4 is 1,000 times more than CD28 or B7. The only reason why a naive T cell doesn't bind to CTLA4, even with that high affinity, is because at this time in the infection, it's inside the cell, so it cannot bind to it. So <clears throat> once once the CTLA4 binds to it, it makes the APC, it makes it difficult for the APC to reactivate these cells. On the other hand, some of these activated T cells also uh, express PD1 or program debt uh, one. And what it means is that it's uh, in the tissue. So this is more in the secondary lymphoid organs where they have to reactivate T cells. On the other hand, there are activated T cells in the tissue and they can keep killing unless they, uh, they themselves are stopped. So how does that happen? On the inflamed cells, there are these, um, so tissue cells have, they express something called PD1 ligand and that binds to the PD-1 that's expressed on the activated T cells, and that helps to prevent proliferation of the activated T cells. That's how the T cells in the tissue are, are deactivated. In general, uh, the other way to reduce the amount of inflammatory response is because um, uh, all the players that help to mount an immune response have a very limited uh, half-life. So if you think about neutrophils, they live for days, in K cells up to a week. Macrophages in general have a very long life, but they are in resting stage. When, um, and they, they, ha they are activated and are kept in their activated state by interferon gamma. But that comes from NK cells. NK cells have short life. So once the NK cells are no longer there, they're the source of interferon gamma is gone. So the macrophages are not in their activated stage, but they return to their resting stage. Dendritic cells, uh, they, what they can, again, dendritic cells can be long living, but once they travel to the lymph node, uh, their life is only up to a week. And the thought is that dendritic cells from the tissue are bringing the antigens to the lymph node and where they are going to activate T cells. They live for a week and after that they die. That means if the antigen has reduced in the periphery, it's not bringing in new ones. That means we don't need that new T cells to be activated. So as long as the dendritic cells are not keep bringing in new um, uh, new reservoir of antigen, it's going to stop. The activation of the T cells is going to stop. In the Plasma B cells live for about five days. So those cells are going to produce antibodies for that. That that's like I think that's the half life. So for only a short time, and then those antibodies are no longer required by the body so for, to fight that infection, so it stops. Uh, and then the antibodies themselves have short half-life, the maximum is for the IgG, which is about three to four weeks. All right, and so what happens if, uh, say, there are cells in the periphery that, that are fighting um, that do get re-stimulated and they don't, they have a lot of these T cells in the periphery. How do you eliminate that? So that's done by something called activation-induced cell death. And once the, um, the, the T cells are obsolete and they have done their job after multiple times that they are reactivated, their fast ligand binds to fast protein. Um, sorry, the fast protein on the activated T cells binds to the fast ligand on the CTL and that makes it, um, makes them uh, get go under undergo apoptosis. So how does that happen? So activated T cells are more sensitive to fast ligand, but the naive T cells are not. And that's the reason the naive T cells uh, don't bind to fast ligand. All right, so that's all for the attenuation of immune response. Any questions? If this is gonna be pretty short, then we are gonna go through jeopardy. So um, let me know if you have questions. Um, All right, so now we're going to talk about the uh, training of the T cells in the, in the thymus. So uh, something called central tolerance and uh, peripheral tolerance. And we're going to talk about how these T cells and B cells and NK cells get trained to do what they do. 
So for the T cells, there's something called central tolerance that occurs in thymus. Thymus, as we all know, is a primary lymphoid organ, and it has a, uh, a region called cortex, or the outer part, and then the inner part is called medulla. There are no incoming lymphatics that bring any lymphocytes, and then, uh, or no high endothelial venules in thymus. So, however, from the cells that are destined to become T cells enter the, come from the bone marrow um, and enter the uh, thymus. So not all the cells come into the thymus. So there is a restricted entry, uh, even though there are no HEVs, right? And then once the, the training is done, these cells, these thymocytes are uh, developed T cells, exit through near the corticomedullary junction via blood. Uh, however, I don't think this is like, um, again, this information is just evolving, so we don't know a lot about how the uh, cells enter and exit the thymus. All right, so the, once the, these cells that are called thymocytes enter the uh, thymic cortex, they do not have any markers on them. So no CD4, no CD8, no CD3, uh, or TCR on their surface, and they are called new T cells. When they go through their, the, oh, while they are progressing in the cortex, they, are, they develop both CD4 and CD8 markers on their surface and they are called double positive T cells. At this stage, they are pretty, um, they are very high in volume, but they die pretty quickly. They are very prone to death. Um, and once these double positive T cells uh, go through the cortex and medulla, only ones that pass some of these tests, they are tested uh, as we call them. Uh, once they pass and graduate the tests that they are need to go through, they reach uh, graduation, so they are called thymic graduates or immigrants, and then they exit the thymus. So how does that testing work? In the cortex, they undergo something called positive selection. So each T cell that comes to the cortex is asked a question, can they react, can they bind to the MSC, self MSC? So MSC is bound to the peptide, so it has to bind in a way uh, that it can interact with that MSC to bind with appropriate affinity in the cortex. So if the answer is yes, then they survive, and that's the reason it's called positive selection. Who gives them, who offers this test? It's this, te this specific cell called cortical thymic epithelial cell, which basically is going to have those MSC with the peptide on them, and they are going to interact with these thymocytes or T cells, developing T cells, to see which, uh, whether they go through and um, can bind to the MSC or not. So here, once they bind to, say, class 2 MSC, then they are going to develop into CD4 positive T cells. And if they bind to the MSC class 1, they are going to be CD8 positive cells. So we get what we call single positive cells here. Once they go through this testing of positive selection, they kind of progress into the medulla of the thymus where they interact with two other types of cells, medullary thymic epithelial cells and thymic dendritic cells. And what these do is they are going to present different kinds of self-antigens. So some say antigens from the heart or the kidney or things like that, or uh, the, the proteins or protein antigens that are common to all the cells of the body. So these are presented through the bound to the MSC on these cells. And the question is, can you bind to these self-antigens? And the answer, correct answer is no, right? So if they do bind to the self-antigens, then they are going to be deleted. So if they, if they do not uh, bind to those self-antigens, then they are going to survive, so it's called negative selection. Once they go through a positive selection and negative selection, they, they basically graduate from the thymus and exit the thymus uh, and go into the blood circulation. So the double positive T cells are about 60 million in the thymus compared to what comes out after that selection process is uh, it's reduced to about 2 million. So you can see how uh, they, uh, most of the cells are deleted during these selection processes. All right, so that was the central tolerance. Now we are going to talk about the kind of peripheral tolerance, but before peripheral, when we talk about peripheral tolerance, we are talking about tissues. But then these lymphocytes first go and recirculate in the secondary lymphoid organ. 
So there, it's important to know that that too plays a role in developing tolerance. And what, what it means is there is a specific traffic pattern, as we had looked at it last time, that the naive T cells only recirculate in the uh, secondary lymphoid organ and don't go to the tissue. So if there are some specific um, tissue antigen that the thymus did not uh, do a good job with the positive and negative selection, then they might be exposed to, the naive T cells might be exposed to some antigen that it can still react to. But most of the times that's not an issue because the naive T cells are only in the secondary lymphoid organ. They don't go to the periphery, right? So that traffic pattern helps. Now say there are these uh, abundant self antigens uh, that are in the secondary lymphoid organs. Most likely those were the ones that are also present in thymus and went through negative selection so they don't react. But say if there was a rare self antigen in the thymus that it did not so it's so rare that the T cell did not ha go through the negative selection for that, then it would be a self-reactive T cell. But then that self-reactive, that self-antigen is also rare in the secondary lymphoid organ. It's most likely in the periphery. So the naive T cell does not come in contact with it at all. So overall, that antigen is ignored because it's not there, basically. That's called antigen ignorance. So even if there is, it's rare, it's so rare in the secondary lymphoid organ that even if it's there in the secondary lymphoid organ, it's not enough to get the cross-linked um, receptors. So another, uh, so the, there is tolerance that's induced in secondary lymphoid organs is in the thymus, there are these natural t -rex. So we talked about the inducible t uh, when we talked about the intestine. Um, these are the different ones that are called natural deregulatory cells. They have, they are again CD4 positive, so single positive cells, but they express some protein called FOXP3, and that FOXP3 is important for them to give the regulatory function. These natural Tregs, similar to other T cells, are going to enter the lymph nodes and secondary lymphoid organ, and they are kind of um, they kind of help to reduce the number of uh, self-reactive T cells. All right, so now we talk about the periphery. So periphery means the tissue. So how, where, where do we come across that? So once the naive T cells uh, that are only in the secondary lymphoid organ, if say they ex escape the secondary lymphoid organ and go into the tissue, there there is going to be that, say, heart antigen that was not expressed well in the thymus. So that they, maybe this naive T cell is self-reacted with that specific antigen. So then there is a lot of antigen that can be, that can cross-link the TCRs in the periphery, right? So it was not that naive T cell was not supposed to go to that tissue, but it went through for some reason. Then it's going to come across enough antigen to cross-link the, the TCRs, but then there are no co-stimulatory molecules. Um, to help to give them the co-stimulation. And because of that, again, there is no activation. And this, this is called NR. So they are energized to that antigen. Sorry, self-antigen. And then the last one. Say they, that naive T cell, which was self-reactive, went to the periphery, had enough antigen to cross-link, and for some reason also got co-stimulation. Well, then it, it would get activated, uh, but they get activated only for a certain number of uh, activation cycles, and then they go through the AICD that we looked at, so the activation induced uh, cell death. All right, so that was T cell. Questions? So we talked about central, and then we talked central tolerance for T cells, and then we talked about um, tolerance in the secondary lymphoid organs, and then we talked about the peripheral tolerance, right? So now we are going to talk about the B cell tolerance, and pretty similar to T cell, we are going to talk about a couple of exceptions. So these B cells are going to mature in the bone marrow. During their maturation, uh, they go through a process called something called receptor editing, which means if they are self-reactive, the BCRs have an extra um, chance they can take that extra attempt that they are given to change their receptor so that uh, they 
they can change it to non-self-reactive and uh, BCR, which means they are getting a second life because if they cannot get that BCR to be non-self-reactive, then they are going to those B cells are going to die. So that's specific to B cells. Now, say the nice B cell is formed and it goes through the to the secondary lymphoid organs. It's similar. It's going to go through a pattern of trafficking pattern that it's only going to stay in the second, uh, secondary lymphoid organs, so it's not going to come across the tissue antigens to which it might be self-reactive to. And then if it uh, does come to uh, come across a rare self-antigen, it's going to be rare enough that it's not going to cross, uh, cross-link the PCRs, so that's ignorance. And then now say that naive B cell entered the tissue where it was not supposed to go. So mostly they don't go to the tissue but say a naive B cell ended up there, then it's going to have enough antigen to cross-link, but it's not going to provide the code stimulation, which is energy. And then the other, uh, again, a specific to tolerance method for the B cells is in the germinal center. So in the secondary lymphoid organs, there are lymphoid follicles. Once the naive B cells come across their antigen, they are uh, activated and they go through the germinal center where they are going to go through two, uh, two types of um, maturation. One is hypermutate, uh, they are going to go through somatic hypermutation by which they change the antigen binding site. So during that, say they change their antigen binding site, which means they change their PCR. So there is chance that during that process they became self-reactive, right, because they changed their antigen binding. So what happens to those? When they get, um, when they form that BCR by hypermutation or change their BCR, they are again tested against the antigens that are presented by follicular dendritic cells. But remember, the follicular dendritic cells that are in the follicle, they only attach to the antigens that brought in by uh, complement or the anti antibodies from the periphery, which means those are opsonized. So, which means that those those are already known to be dangerous and not likely to be in self-antigen. So that's where they don't get co-stimulation from the, uh, the other T cells called follicular helper T cells, and so they won't go through the whole cycle. So they don't you know, keep uh, that BCR will again change. All right, so that's for the B, B cells, and now for the NK cells. So NK cells, as we know, are basically not adaptive immune cells, but they have these activating receptors and inhibitory receptors, and they use their inhibitory receptors in their selection of the of reaction. So basically, they interact with cells that do not have MSC plus one on them, which means they are not self. Uh, they don't have self MSC, and that's what they target. So if the MSC plus one is missing, they are going to kill that cell. If the MSC plus one is still present on that cell they shouldn't be killing those cells. So that's how they know which one to uh, target. Questions? I think that's it for the selection process. All right, now we're going to talk about the immunological memory. So there is some memory for innate immune system as well, and that memory is just for the patterns, not for the specific invaders. So toll-like receptors are specific for, they have the memory of binding to the specific pattern. And same way, um, NK cells are also known to have some kind of specific um, requirement for what they are going to bind to. B cells. So B cells ha can have B cell memory and they need T cell help for that. So if we think about it, a naive B cell is going to be activated, and once it's activated, it's going to either make a short-lived plasma cell, which is going to make antibodies and will not have any memory. But on the other hand, that activated B cell may turn into a central memory B cell, and it's just going to live in the secondary lymphoid organs. Or it's going to be an activated B cell, which is going to uh, give rise to what we call a long-lived plasma B cell and that long-lived plasma B cell is going to return to the bone marrow. And there it's going to keep producing very small amounts of that specific antibody. On the other hand, the central memory B cells that are in the secondary lymphoid organs are going to 
continue to give rise to these long-lived plasma B cells at, in very small amounts at all times. And if there is, if they come across that antigen, they are also going to produce this short-lived uh, plasma load only if needed. So that's how both these give rise to memory for B cells, central memory B cells, and the long-lived plasma B cells. Questions about that? And then the T cell memory. So T cell memory, again, two types, memory effector T cells and central memory uh, T cells. So what it means is the naive T cells are activated to a T, activated T cell, and that's going to either decide to be a effector T cell or a central memory T cell. And that effector T cell can sometimes just can kill the organisms and be an effector short-lived, or it can be a memory effector T cell. On the other hand, the activated T cell in the secondary lymphoid organs can form what's called central memory T cell and it's going to stay in that secondary lymphoid organ. So again, there is memory cells are also either in the secondary lymphoid organs, which are called central, and then if they are in the tissue, um, they are going to be the effector. All right, so this basically just goes over the properties of adaptive memory cells. So if, if you think about it, we had talked about this, that if there are B cells, they have each one has specificity for only one antibody. So there are lots of B cells, but the specific antibody, specific B cells for one specific specificity is very small. So very small clone of B cells that's present at rest in our body. If you compare it to once you have an infection, the, the B cells fight that infection and form a memory clone of memory B cells for that specificity. That clone is still bigger than the one naive B cell that was present initially. So even though there are very few memory B cells, the one for each specificity is higher than the ones that we had as naive B cells. So, um, Again, it's better equipped to fight the infection to be, even to begin with. And then these memory cells are easier to activate. So they don't need as much co-stimulation uh, and they uh, they'll need less amount of um, cross-linking for it to be activated. And specifically for B, the, the B cells, the memory B cells are already class switched, so they are going to produce the antibody that's specifically needed for that in infection. So if it's a parasite, it would be IgE directly, or if it's a mucosal, it would be IgA, and so on and so forth. And then, um, as we talked about the somatic hypermutation, those those memory B cells are already upgraded to have a better affinity antibodies. So if you think about the innate versus adaptive immunity, and the innate memory is not updatable, so it's pretty much for that pattern and doesn't change, and it's same for you or me or anyone else. Compared to adaptive memory, which basically can is uh, is updatable and it's personal, so yours would be different from mine. All right. So moving on from uh, from the general immunological topics to specific intestinal immune system and the reason I wanted to go through this is it has specific implications like because it does uh, it's more into attenuation rather than activation of the immune system which is different from the intestine. So um, we are going to talk about the innate immune part of the uh, intestinal immune system which is mostly related to its architecture, right? So the innate, the intestine is lined by epithelial barrier, which is the first line of defense. It also has a mucus line, uh, mucus production, which is on top of that epithelial barrier, which also provides a barrier, barrier function. Apart from the barrier function, it can have antibacterial proteins, which help in fighting some of the pathogens that it's going to come across, like lysozyme or alpha defenses. So in small intestine, there is one layer mucosa, um, one layer of mucus. However, in large intestine, there is one mucus layer which is really adherent to the epithelial epithelium, and on the top is another mucus layer which is less dense, and it has alpha defenses which fight the uh, pathogen. And the the function of this mucus is just basically sweep all the bacteria that's coming into the lumen 
and take it off into the field. And then the third one, third type of defense is just the commensals that are present in this intestinal system. They help to break down proteins and make some vitamins, but they also give a competition to the pathogens uh, for these nutrients and help to prevent infection. All right. So say there is an intestinal invasion or uh, uh, say there is a pathogen, then most of the time, if you see here in the intestinal union, if there is a bacteria, that bacteria is going to come across macrophages and then right cells that are going to sense that there is danger. These are going to be carried to the mesenteric lymph nodes through lymphatics. And in there, they are going to activate the T cells and bring in neutrophils and cause the inflammation that's needed to fight that infection off. But most of the time, these bacteria are going to be commensals where we don't need this dramatic um, response. And for that, uh, the thought is that these most of the macrophages that are there in the lamina propria of these, this intestine are non-inflammatory macrophages, which means even when they are activated, they do not release a lot of cytokines. They take care of whatever infection is there. So they're going to react, but the reaction is going to be pretty small so that they don't let um, these bacteria to invade further. Apart from that, there are uh, the intestinal, uh, intestinal wall has IgA antibodies, which are produced by the B cells that are sitting in the, in the lamina propria, so under the epithelium of the intestine. These, can, these uh, B cells can switch to IgA production without the T helper, uh, T helper help in general. And again, these B cells uh, produce IgA in response to something called retinoic acid that's present in that environment, and that's produced by the dendritic cells that are present there. So in presence of that retinoic acid, the B cells are going to produce more IgA. That IgA is going to be secreted into the lumen by a process called transcytosis, and it's going to bind to different bacteria or pathog uh, pathogens or other bacteria in the lumen and just going to kind of clumps of that is going to just go into the um, Yeah, so that's in the lumen. And say if that IgA binds to some, so IgA is in the lamina propria still, and it comes across a pathogen that has already uh, invaded the epithelial barrier, then it can still bind to that pathogen, and by transcytosis, it can still bring it into the lumen and release it into the lumen. So in general, because IgA does not bind to, the SP portion doesn't bind to neutrophils or NK cells like the IgG does, uh, it basically doesn't cause as much inflammation. So in general, the immune system for intestine has a distributed but private response. What it means is, as you know, other places, if there is an infection in the toe, the inflammatory cells are going to go only to the toe, not anywhere else. However, in the intestine, if there is a commensal or a pathogen in one part, it's going to, the immune cells are going to go to a wider range, not just at that point, just because those pathogens can, if you leave them there, they are going to go and not let them enter from one part, they might go to the other part and enter. So they, the, you need that uh, protective response to a wider range, the wider uh, range of the intestine. However, it doesn't go into the systemic circulation. So those activated T and B cells are still going to come back to the intestine rather than go to the, the kidney or somewhere else. Um, and then the anti-inflammatory environment is uh, is made sure is made sure by the TGF beta and IL-10 that's produced by the T regs that are inducible in the um, intestine. So questions about anything any of these? All right. So again, as I said, the commensals help to have uh, make sure that they have an anti-inflammatory action uh, along with competing with the pathogens that I talked about. So some of these commensals produce butyrate, a, a substance that helps to produce more uh, more IT regs from the TH0 cells. Uh, there's a, a commensal called B fragilis, and it produces something called polysaccharide A, and in presence of that, the T cells produce more IL-10. 
again another fermental called bifidobacterium will help will help to produce more IL-10 from the dendritic cells. So overall, the environment in the intestine is towards anti-inflammatory um, environment. All right. So what happens if there is a true infection? If it continues to have that anti-inflammatory environment and say there is a real infection, it has to be prepared to fight it. And how does the uh, intestinal immune cells know how to differentiate between that? So in general, dendritic cells in presence of TGF beta produce IT regs. However, if there is a serious infection, that there are there is going to be interference gamma or uh, other cytokine environments where the TH cells are going to produce more TH1 type of cells that will produce interferon gamma and switch to IgG. However, if there is a milder infection, there along with TGF beta, in specific kinds of infection, there will be IL-6 that's released. And in presence of IL-6 along with TGF beta, the TH cells are going to produce more TH17 and IL-17 type of response and get more neutrophil cells. So those would produce IL-17 and IL-21 and uh, give the neutrophilic response. Also, dendritic cells switch from TGF-beta to this TGF-beta and IL-6 uh, IL so that the IT regs are produced. Um, but that depends on the size of the invasion. So depending on whether TGF-beta is more or IL-6, it depends on that that the TH cells are going to um, change to the subset according to the size of the infection. All right, so that was all for the immune response. I have a couple of slides for the vaccines. Um, I'm just going to go over, I don't I don't think I'm going over the full chapter. I'm just going to kind of go over the different types of vaccines. So they are non-infectious and attenuated live vaccines. So non-infections can be different types. They, uh, they give rise to memory T helper, cell, helper response and B cell response compared to the live uh, vaccines, which will initiate memory T helper response, B response, but also CTL response, which is missing in the non-infection vaccines. So different types of non-infectious vaccines, killed vaccines where the full virus is killed and treated with something like formaldehyde and uh, given in the vaccine compared to a toxoid where the tox toxoid toxin produced from the diphtheria or tetanus is purified and treated with aluminum salt. Another one is acellular, for example, uh, pertussis, where only a part of the, the cell of the virus is used. There are something called subunit uh, vaccines now, which are basically viral proteins, so only part, not even part of the cell, it's just specific proteins uh, that are produced by genetic engineering, and that's for specific for hepatitis B. And then something called carrier vaccines, where a gene can be introduced in a non-disease-causing virus. Um, and I think that's kind of, I don't think we are using it of those. Um, so that's for the non-infectious types of vaccines. The attenuated or live vaccines are something like MMR, varicella, and we have a list, right? And so the uh, significant points for the live vaccines are one that they uh, they help to uh, get memory T, uh, CTL kind of response. They can also help in getting herd immunity. Um, and then uh, the problems with the live vaccines, as we know, is they can cause infection in immunocompromised. But also in some of the immunocompetent hosts, if before the host's immune system kicks in. Um, the virus mutates, there is still a rare chance of having infection. So in general, if you think about the vaccine, it has the protein or the full cell or the full virus uh, that, uh, that shows that it's a foreign protein and the immune, re immune system needs to make immune response to those. But how does it know that there is danger involved? So that danger signal needs is missing when you give you don't give the full full virus vaccine, right? So the danger end is it's uh, killed. If it's killed, it doesn't have a danger signal. So for that, for the vaccine to give a danger signal, it needs an adjuvant, 
like some ad ad additive that helps to tell the immune system that this is ready. And most of the times what we use is purified alum or modified LPS that is part of it. Yeah, I can put it in there. It doesn't take long. She printed it off she pinned it online. That's why it takes forever to print. Oh. So what I did is I copied to and put it on my hey, you're, still, you're coming through. Can you meet your oh, can you meet your phone please? It's not there. there you go. Okay. Mm. <laughs> that's easier. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for today's uh, chapter. Do we have some lecture that they need to be logged in? No. What's your second quote? No. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Portnoy is doing how to write a, how to write a is that on paper. Cola? And yeah, he would probably like yeah. that on Cola. But if you want to end it now, we can start it again. Because you want to do Jeopardy? Okay. Do it. Up to you. You guys are good? OK. Yeah. All right. So we'll keep going for memory brain cells in action. <laughs> All right. So let's start our Jeopardy. This is for the Sumpera. So Amanda and Maggie, this is for real money. Huh? Put money up front. No. Real money. <laughs> <laughs> so for Jeopardy for immunology part, are you guys are on your own. It's <laughs> And uh, Dr. Raj, no. as far as the, for your evaluation too. Yeah, so great on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, <laughs> funky move. Yeah, well, funky. the one that's sticking on us today. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, whose birthday is coming up? Mine. Really? Can, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, go oh. ahead. Mine passed. Oh. I'm in May. I'm in, I'm in February. Oh, I uh, oh, I win. In four months. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Dowling. Lordy. So, for these uh, answers, you have to come up with a question. Yeah, you must answer so, it properly. Like what is the Jeopardy format? For. Yeah. Oh no. What is? Okay, you just have to say what is. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's do Lim for two hundred. Okay. Do we all? Oh, sorry, we didn't. I know that last time you guys were not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, if you want to be okay. Yeah, we can. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, you slap. Oh, no, I was just <laughs> asking. Oh, you did? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, you slap. Um, bone marrow. What? Is oh, sorry, what is bone marrow? Like one more. One more. Where are the teeth from? Oh, what is it? Diamond? Yeah. Am I supposed to slap it in? Okay. <laughs> you got it. What is I didn't know that. So we, hey. you, I'm used to playing where like the, you get to have the first shot if you're the, no. if you're the one that picks the card. Uh, That's not it. Okay. Oh no, you are just picking the category and then okay. whoever yeah. buzzes yeah. in. Sure. Unfortunately. Okay. okay. So it's going to take us like 10 minutes to get that okay. buzzer on and off. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. okay. The buzzer. Okay. Um, I'm not sure at Halloween is. That sounds fun. Yeah, that's that for sounds fun. Do that for sure. It sounds like Halloween. Mm -hmm. According to Irish <laughs> legend, this Halloween light is named after someone who was forbidden to enter both heaven and hell. Whoa. Halloween light. What is it, jack o lantern? Yeah. Oh. oh. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Tricky. Thank you. I want to make one this weekend. I'm going to save some of those fun ones. Let's do S words yeah. for 200. <laughs> Okay. Organs such as lymph nodes and virus patches are this type of lymphoid organ. Secondary? What is secondary lymphoid organ? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is not too bad. Yeah, it's just good. Yeah. <laughs> this is where my brain's at right now. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is some parax, so it's supposed to be easy yeah. to remember. Yeah. Okay. Except for this. <laughs> we'll learn the eight names for everything. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, um, Presenting the engine for 400. 400? Sure. Mm. Mm -hmm. The TCR complex is compromised, comprised of these. It's not only you, so don't feel that it's like just you, but whoever wants to write. Okay. Can you just name all the subunits? Uh, what are what is alpha or what are? Say it again. The, oh, there's delta. There are epsilon and then there's zeta subunits. Does that count? 
So you can so alpha beta is what? Is the TCR type. So six. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Six in the picture. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. So that can be either alpha beta or or a gamma delta. delta. And then what are you talking about? The subunit for? Like CD three. So CD three. So that okay. gives the answer. But you said epsilon, zeta, and there's epsilon, zeta, and there's like one gamma and one delta. Yep. Gamma and delta. Two epsilon. Mean, so the answer was good enough for CD three oh. and TCR. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you got it. So. Okay. S words for four hundred. This disease results from the complete absence of T cells. Skid. What is uh, skid? <laughs> what are skids? What are skids? <laughs> what are skid kids? <laughs> um, let's do the most happy category for two hundred. Do you know what that means? No. Image. Oh. <laughs> Duh. Genes that Real inform quick. human LSD molecules are called this. What are H1? Mm -hmm. Or what is H1? Yeah. Yeah, the, this and R is harder than it what was. What are my pronouns? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do less for 400. Not to be confused with Langer and cells, these cells capture pathogens and present them to B cells in lymph nodes. What are oh, in the lymph nodes? Mm -hmm. What are follicular dendritic cells? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. What do you presenting an antigen for 600? Left of the poor 200. It is an activating accessory molecule of T cells that binds to CD18 and CD86 on the APC. What is CD28? Yeah. So CD eighty eighty six or B seven one and oh, okay. 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 The S birds for 600. Manifestations of this disease include a red rash on the cheek, arthritis, and chronic renal failure. Uh, what is, uh, I was going to say like a leaf publicist, but I guess yeah. the other things too. No, that's good. That's right. <laughs> what is a lupus? <laughs> what is a lupus? <laughs> what is a lupus? <laughs> uh, most happy for 600. This protein transports peptides across the endothelium reticulum, so they may be displayed on class 1M. Oh. What is TAP? Can you give us the important? Yeah, let's transport activating protein. <laughs> Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween book. What? The Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. The annual Halloween candy sales in the United States alone <laughs> averaged this amount of oh. dollars. Really? Anyone any other guesses? What is four billion? Uh, great. Three point seven million. That's good. Yeah. Hello? That's like less than a dollar uh, per person. 300 million people. Okay, well, what's your guess? Just the United States. No. Two billion. Wow, you guys are wow. much closer yeah. than me. Dang. Can you give me? Jeez. <laughs> In categories. Okay. This is the number of colors M&M &M candies come in. Standardly or like oh, special okay. order? Uh, oh, she knows. Okay. Yeah, hey, you slapped. Well, I was still counting. No, go for it. Go for it. What is six? You think? You can Anyone order else? any color you want from them and then I was three. surprised. Like, I wouldn't even have. Like, that's what I was doing. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. this is for any color. Oh. I got all their Easter ones and uh -huh. stuff, too. Oh, I was thinking of, like, the package. And they green, make, blue, like, the, the brown, brown, yellow, orange, red. Yeah. 
Oh, that's it? Oh. Yeah, I like they're going to be Not nearly as cool. Okay. Mm. <laughs> okay. The black You. Okay. I'm going to close this. What? How about preventing it in the The response of T cells to protein antigens requires the capture and display by this type of cell. What are energy expenditures? Yep. Did I hear the trick? Yeah, I was like, wait, Yeah, sure. Most happy. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this class of MSC is paired with beta 2 microglobulin. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what are... <laughs> Have you got you? Um, uh, <laughs> well, that case, I'm going to go with what is class one. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. All right, Maggie. Um, S words for 800. This condition is a whole body inflammatory <laughs> response that occurs in response to a pathogen. What is sir? Awesome. Oh, yeah, it's just this. Okay. Got this. Oh, what is S words for a thousand? What is that? <laughs> no, whatever. <laughs> you see the process leads to MSC restriction in the time. We literally just learned it. Uh -huh. yep. It's in there somewhere. First one. Like, what is self tolerance something? So which one? The type of Selection. Which one? Positive. Oh. I can't think of what starts with an S. No, that's it. I mean, but it's selection, I guess. Oh, so it's it's positive. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Positive selection. <laughs> there she what goes. Why did you start? Positive. positive. <laughs> <laughs> I tripped myself up. <laughs> um, let's put hello in for 800. I'm going to have on for a little bit. <laughs> This Halloween treat was invented in Philadelphia in 1880 by candy maker George Renninger. Hershey? What is candy crush? Yeah. What? What? Well, how did you know that? What's candy crush? What? I'll buy you okay. some. Those little it's things. basically solidified corn syrup in the shape of a triangle. <laughs> with You'll love it. Different colors. Oh, good. You'll love it. It's so good. <laughs> Triangle with lots of lots of color on it. Yeah, yeah. With lots of artificial color. Artificial color. <laughs> pull the and picture sugar. for him. What? I'll pull up. Okay, yeah, just a second. Okay. Yeah. Candy corn. Candy is corn. That a corn sugar or corn sugar? No, I don't know. No, it looks, they look, like they look like it's like corn, corn. right? They oh, look yeah. like corn kernels. Really? Except they're triangular yeah. instead yeah. of. Never knew a lot that. Longer. Yeah. Like a little longer, but. Yeah. Like it. Okay. I love them. I love candy corn. You can eat so many all at once, but then they start to get a little waxy in your mouth. <laughs> I like M&M's, but I missed yeah. M&M candy question. Uh, MHP for 800. This protein occupies the oh, binding plate of class of two women while in the endoplasmic risk. I can't even come up with an intelligent word. <laughs> okay, go for it, second years. What is the invariant chain? Mm. Look how smart we'll be next year. I know. Mm -hmm. That's because we both took immunology degrees, right? We have masters. <laughs> <laughs> That's a master for 800, please. No, no. Okay. He's just being <laughs> heard. <laughs> you are on a roll today. <laughs> Sorry, what did you do? Flip for 800. <laughs> these cells, not this cell, these cells transport, what is this? Grammar is completely butchered here. So these mm -hmm. cells transport antigens from the lumen of the small intestine into the underlying tissue. Mm, yep, just read this one too. Um, what 
of cutting an antigen break. Less than 5% of the T cells in circulation have this type of receptor. We just talked about the T cell receptors, right? Which I shouldn't have, I guess, in anticipation of this question, but hey! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Maggie. <laughs> I know, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Not alpha beta. So it's but gamma <laughs> delta. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Go ahead. Oh yeah, that's me. Um, how about the most happy category for a thousand? What's the name? This is the name of the site of MSC allele present on each chromosome. But that does tell me the BD. I don't know. Dark with an H. Half globe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, what is haplotype? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. You get the point. Uh, yes. Uh, let's go with Halloween for a hello win for a thousand. <laughs> The origin of the word witch, witch came from the old English word, I don't even know how to say it. Witch. Yeah, Wicca. we don't either. Wicca? Which one? Oh, Wicca? I would have never guessed that. And I don't like dental, but I still put it in there. Like, it's like pure no. or divine or something weird like that? I think it's probably like devil or something or other. That's what I, I, that's what I would have expected. No, oh, it's a good word. Really? Isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give it. Yeah, we don't know. Why? Ah. So they burn all these wives' women. Yeah. Just for like a little. No, but like Wicca is a religion. You know. All right. Which is. Uh, remember. They had their. Old English was actually a form of Saxon, which was German, and so the double S was a oh. common, commonly used double S for an S. Sorry, double S? Uh, double S? So, so this is for an S? Oh, 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 for Y. I see where you're going. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, interesting. We're supposed to remain stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that turned out well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I'm going to go with this. Okay. <laughs> the T cell region of the spleen is called. It's somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. It's an acronym. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You're certified in this. The, the, the PAL, yeah, PAL right? Yeah. yeah. What is the PAL? Yeah. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> you're not. Yes. Here we are. I wanted to call it the PAL, and I was like, that's not that's right. That's right, yes. Okay, presenting an antigen. If a bacterial pathogen is presented by an APC to a T cell, that T cell may differentiate into a TH1 cell and predominantly secrete the cytokine. So TH1 cytokine. I don't want each word. <laughs> There's so many. I, uh, what is interfering cell? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Done. Good job, guys. Yay. Yay. Good job. Done with some parents. Thank you. Thank you.